In terms of what you tell a parent, it's really tough. One thing I can say is these people need love. They need love. They need support. And so you may not be able to have them under your roof, but to say, don't call me anymore. I'm withdrawing my love in so many words because you've just been such a disappointment. That's further shaming a person who's grappling with feeling shame. The figuring and, out how to set some boundaries is so important, but they need to be. Well, and I boundaries. think you need to try to have honest conversations with them. But if you can yourself try to shed that sense of shame, like I can't tell my neighbors and I, I want you to be quiet about this because this is just all, you know, no one in our family has ever done this before. You're just shaming us. That's completely the opposite of what these people need. They need your love and support. Today, I'm speaking with Jesse Dunlevy. Jesse is the author of a newly released memoir, Cover My Dreams in Ink. It's the story of her son, Paul's life. The memoir portrays Paul's uphill battle with disabilities and Jesse's fight for an appropriate education and suitable health care through to the fight for Paul's life as he entered the harrowing world of addiction. Jessie spent her career as an educator, first as a university librarian and then as a school administrator, the latter being a 30-year stint. In this interview, Jessie shares what she's learned as a result of raising a child with differences and the tragic overlay of failed systems that too often shortchange the most vulnerable among us. Paul's death was preventable, and Jessie has become a staunch advocate for drug policy reform. She's also committed to helping others cope with the challenges of a substance use disorder, as well as the loss of a child, and to fighting the stigma that has crippled the needed reform. In this interview, we talk about the need for legislative change in addressing the overdose crisis and the impediments to getting legislation introduced and passed. Jesse also reads some excerpts from some of Paul's writings. Have a tissue handy as you listen to this interview, but listen to it. Don't shy away because it's hard to listen to. We need you. We need everyone to be as educated as possible on this topic and advocate for change. Jesse, welcome to the Onward Podcast. Thank you, Emily. Thanks for having me. You are passionate about advocating for legislative change to address the opioid crisis. And I was just, I thought that that would be a good way to start the episode for you to tell us why you're so passionate about that. Why does that topic hit home for you? Well, it hits home for me because of all that I've come to know about it. And I think most people that are well-informed about an issue that represents a, a real injustice can fall into passion. The reason that I learned what I've learned is that my son died of an overdose in 2017. And I had already started to read and do some research before he died. But after he died, it just took off in terms of my passion to know, to understand, to understand everything I could about his final hours and to understand everything I could about what could have gone differently. And so I did a lot of inward looking as well as outward. And and I did write a book. How old was your son? He was 34. He was 34 and he had a lot of disabilities. So while he was 34, he was still very, not entirely dependent on me, but we were very close and he was tentative with a lot of the things that life calls on you to do. He would ask me a lot about how to maneuver in a certain situation. So he he had a language impairment and attentional problems and just really struggled in school. So he lived around the corner at that point. He did have his own apartment for the first time in that So he was developmentally delayed, I guess you'd say. So he was 34, but he probably was somewhere in the neighborhood in terms of maturity of his early 20s. Well, it's interesting that I just know from my experience and my education on the opioid crisis is that people really don't pay attention to it enough because they don't think it's going to ever happen to them or their child. Because they think, I mean, I've had I've had somebody tell me, Emily, I'm a good parent and uh, we eat dinner tonight together every night. So I would know. If my children were doing drugs. Famous last words. I know. And certainly it's not something that happens to everybody, but 
It happens in all kinds of families. It cuts through all aspects of society. And interestingly, it is the most vulnerable, though, that tend to have the most chaotic use and the most difficulty overcoming it. So what do you mean by the most vulnerable? Marginalized populations, poverty, people that maybe don't have much hope for the future, no skills. They don't have role models that have skills or anything to fall back on. There's, or maybe something traumatic that happened in their past. And I don't really mean to overly focus on that. But the fact of the matter is most people that use highly addictive drugs do not become addicted. Mm-hmm. You know, I was raised to think you try it once and that's it. You're hooked forever. And it's just not true. People use addictive drugs all the time and walk away from it. And in fact, a lot of people, because young people don't have the judgment that they have as they mature and they will take risks and they experiment and they just do. And so, but most people by far, you can trip through college or through your early twenties and then you've got a promotion or a job that interests you or pending marriage or a child and you, you gradually grow up. And we all do that, whether we're walking away from what kind of ever, you know, youthful decisions that we made. So most people do not become addicted. Then, interestingly, of the people who do meet the criteria for addiction, 80% of these people get over it without any treatment whatsoever. So they don't make the news because there's nothing sensational about it. But they were addicted. They get over it. So it is really the minority of people who have used addictive drugs that are the ones that are in trouble with it and that need more support than the person who just walked away from it. Mm -hmm. So that right there puts you in a more vulnerable category. And sadly, they're the people that we we tend to punish and to shame and to incarcerate instead of helping them. It's it's an illness. So you, your career was um, a school administrator? I have a master's degree in library science, and I was an academic librarian before I had children. And then I stayed home for a couple of years with my children. And when I went back to work, trying to blend having little kids with wanting a career, I went to work in the library in their school. And I only had that position for a year before I moved into the administration. And then I stayed there for 30 years. Interesting. Wow. So how many children do you have? Well, I had Paul, and then I have his older sister, three years older, Keely. How long did Paul struggle with addiction before he passed away? It started in his early 20s. Okay. And it was off and on. You know, I wouldn't say that the whole time he was actively using, he -hmm. would walk away from it for a while. And it seemed to me that every time he did, it got a little longer that he was able to sustain it. But he did relapse and, and most people do. You know, that's another misfortune in the whole thing is that the addiction is defined as a, as a chronic chaotic use of drugs. It's a relapsing condition and that you seek these drugs regardless of um, negative consequences. And so it's a relapsing condition, but yet relapse is seen as failure and you're often booted from the organization or the people that are trying to help you. So if that's a flaw. That is, I mean, people relapse and get cancer again or another illness again. You know, and this is a medical condition. I don't think it's a disease, but there's no point in debating that. It is a medical condition and it requires some expertise in, in getting you through it. No two people are exactly alike. And oftentimes with, again, this population that needs the help, there are co-occurring conditions. Mm-hmm. There is a mental illness or some kind of other aspect of life that needs also to be examined. So they need medication, maybe not everybody does, but they need counseling. They need an array of things. And too many of our treatment facilities don't offer the full array. And so there's a lot of um, holes in, in where somebody lands when they go into treatment. And certainly the, you know, the treatment in the United States isn't regulated or, or controlled by as other medical conditions would be. And, and we just, it's singular in, in every way. If you relapse, then you're booted out, whether it was good care or poor care. And, you know, if you're a diabetic, chances are it's your life choices that landed you there, but no one kicks you out of healthcare because you ate a box of jelly donuts. And the same is true with the smoker who has lung cancer. No one's going to say we won't treat you if you continue to smoke. But that's what we say with this medical condition. If you continue to use, we can't help you. 
So before we get into the legislation that you're, you're recommending, and what advice would you give for parents who are going through this right now, who have children that are using drugs, whether they be, maybe you have different advice for people who have children living in the home versus adult children, like your son was, what's a parent to do? It's really not easy, but I'll tell you a few things I've learned just, and I've learned it from my research. So it's supported by the data is that coerced treatment isn't effective. And so some, you know, this idea of like kidnapping them in the night and, and taking them someplace, it doesn't work. And now that doesn't mean that there's no person ever who's come out of the better side with something like that. But statistically, it doesn't work. And that's one of the problems with drug courts, because they will give you the choice of incarceration or treatment. And if you don't want treatment, I've known some people to opt for the incarceration. So anyway, that's another whole tangent. Yeah. But we need to understand that a person has to be ready for treatment. So in terms of what you tell a parent, it's really tough. One thing I can say is these people need love. They need love. They need support. And so you may not be able to have them under your roof, but to say, don't call me anymore. I'm withdrawing my love in in so many words because you've just been such a disappointment. That's further shaming a person who's grappling with feeling shame. Figuring out how to set some boundaries is so important, but they need to be. Well, and I think you need to try to have honest conversations with them. But if you can yourself try to shed that sense of shame. Like I can't tell my neighbors and I I want you to be quiet about this because this is just all, you know, no one in our family has ever done this before. You're just shaming us. That's completely the opposite of what these people need. They need your love and support. So what does a a parent needs to, to not shame themselves? Oh, and parents, you know, you could get help from somebody who's maybe been through it or somebody who has some wisdom that you don't have, or just because you're in the middle of something, you're not as good at navigating as somebody else would be. But so many people just weather it alone because of the shame. They go to work and they don't tell anybody. You know, if your child has cancer, people are making you dinners, but you're grappling with this and nobody, you know, wants to talk about it. And I think that starts with the person who's suffering with it. And one thing that I did, and I've seen other people do it, is I, you know, acknowledged that Paul had a drug problem. And so I was the one who was left to make most of the decisions. And maybe I was too isolated in that way. But I think that love is the most important thing. And then there is help out there. But you have to have the mindset that abstinence isn't the only goal. And that's where we also get tripped up because we're really fanatics about abstinence. And that's something that person can't attain. So the idea of any positive change is what could be focused on. And gradually people do begin to want that treatment. And once they want the treatment, you're in a much better position, but you should be equipped with knowing how to seek treatment that's effective instead of putting them into just any old bed. And some of these places have do not have a good track record. And some of them are actually sort of scam-like, but I'm not pointing fingers saying that that's the case. Usually a lot of good-hearted people are providing treatment. But if they don't have the full array of options for the ways that you recover, then the person is being shortchanged. Because medication, it shouldn't be something that is urged or that is certainly nothing should be forced. But a person going into treatment should be told, here are the options and here is the upside and the downside. Here's the data. And you can choose because these people can make decisions for themselves. You know, we treat them like they're just not even quite human. And so the medication route, uh, particularly buprenorphine and methadone, FDA approved for a long, long time, has proven to be the most effective in terms of recovery. So that it has very good track record. The percentage of lives that are saved with people on one of those two medications long-term is 50 to 70%. Right, I, know, I know some people look down on that and think that, you know- they, The of- treatment is just as shameful as the condition itself. It's all bundled together. And our country impedes your access to that treatment. And other countries have dropped that. And the results just are startling death rate drops tremendously. Yeah. So what legislative recommendations do you have? Well, there would be traction are you getting? 
there would be a whole lot of them if you, first of all, harm reduction. Everything that falls under the umbrella of harm reduction, we should embrace with open arms because it is truly harm reduction and the medications that have proven to be effective once you get to the treatment phase. That is the ticket out. What's harm reduction for listeners who don't? Well, harm reduction in its broadest sense is seat belts in cars and sunscreen, helmets. Mm -hmm. Some of them are legislated. Some are just common sense. You know, there are no police telling you to put your sunscreen on, but you just put your sunscreen on. So so you know how to take care of yourself in that way. So in Mm -hmm. essence, it is strategies that reduce the harm of risks that you take things that you do driving on the highway. And so for drug users, harm reduction entails clean syringes and everybody from the Surgeon General to any medical study since the 80s with the HIV crisis knows that not only do clean syringes prevent health issues such as the abscesses that you get from using a dirty needle, but it greatly reduces the spread of HIV and, and hepatitis C and other communicable diseases. So, and the expense of a clean needle versus the expense of caring for somebody that has one of those conditions is so vast. It's one of the most money-saving interventions that we can have, but yet not all states have approved it. And then within each state, it can go county by county. I went to Annapolis once for, I can't remember what the issue is, but we were advocating for some kind of legislative change. And we really tried to get the word out to get as many people to participate in that as possible. And only a handful of people showed up. So whereas if there was somebody had mentioned at that time that they had had a gun rally recently, this was several years ago, and Mm -hmm. thousands of people showed up. So how do you get the attention of legislators to make a change? Well, it's hard because I've lobbied in the Maryland General Assembly for decriminalizing paraphernalia and for overdose prevention sites. And overdose prevention sites is something I'm extremely passionate about. Now, if you have a needle exchange program, let me just back up for a minute, because that entails offering people the syringes and caring for them if they do have an abscess or some other health-related condition. It prevents them from using dirty needles and from hiding their dirty needles outside somewhere. So they come inside and they, they over time, I heard the Surgeon General speak this year at the Cato Institute, and he's a conservative guy, but he said it's just so proven. It saves lives. And beyond that, one of the most crucial aspects of it is that you form relationships with these people. Yeah. Because they're so used to being shoved into back alleys and under a rock. And then we shame them further because they live under a rock and they go in and there's not a, there, it's low threshold in terms of what you have to do to get the attention of these people. And so they want to help you. They're medical personnel that want to help you. And to these people, that's so bolstering. Yeah. And so over time, and they don't have to sign in with their real name and they form relationships and they might have been skeptical at first because they're afraid of the police, they're afraid of the health department, but they will go in there and they form relationships. And don't you know, over time, they're the people who ultimately decide to seek treatment. Whereas the person under the rock, they're, they're so far from anything civilized that they don't think like that. They think there's no way out. So these programs, and as as Jerome Adams said, Mm -hmm. and I heard him this year speak, he said, they have to know that you care before they care what you know. And so I thought it's true. So a safe consumption site, which is not legal in the United States yet, well, there's some nuances there, but that offers the clean syringes and the other harm reduction materials such as test strips. But they also enable you to use your drugs while you're inside the safe consumption site. Mm -hmm. And every modern country in the world has them. Every modern country in the world has had them for years and years and years. But the United States is just behind the curve. And it's the reason that the United States has by far the highest overdose death rate, too. It's sad. It's truly sad. It's very so sad. I've lobbied for the for the um, overdose prevention sites. And I thought to myself, when you go into a legislator's office and you think, oh, wait. first of all, I can acknowledge that on the surface, these are counterintuitive. Yeah. You're saying you want to give a person who uses drugs a place to use drugs. No, I don't think so. But you know, when you present the statistics and the reasoning behind it and the outcome that's been 
collected from other places in the world. I, you really see this, them start to shift. And I've had people say to me, I do understand now. I understand that what you're saying makes sense. But I know darn well they're not going to vote for it. Well, the key is because their is- constituents would run them out of town. So, so the stigma that this country has with regard to drug use is so pervasive that it is the very thing that's keeping even the legislation from operating on, on science. And the the key gap is between that- research and practice in this country is massive. Right. And the key is to get people's attention and everyone's attention span is so short, right? So to get their attention enough and get them to listen enough to really understand and to be open to other ideas is really hard to do. Did you ever know Ginger Moreland Rosella? She lived in the Annapolis area and she, her son passed away of an overdose in 2013, Jake, and she helped get the Good Samaritan law passed. And I'm familiar with the Good Samaritan Law. And one of the things that we were working on a couple of years ago was making some improvement to that. But, you know, once you get the legislation in there, then you can fine tune it. And Jill so was that, a guest on the uh, Onward podcast, and she passed away last May in a motorcycle accident. So it's oh. too bad. I would have, I would connect you to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your book. Well, the book, my son died in April. and. I don't need to tell you what a horrible time that was. For one thing, he was on the upswing in his life and we had tried to get him help. Here's an example, though, of some of the limitations. He came to me and he said, and he hadn't used drugs for over a year. He came to me and he said, I relapsed, mom. And he had a job that he liked. He liked the apartment. And he said, I can't lose everything because of a relapse. It's just not right. I can't lose everything. So I said, well, maybe, you know, we need to get some help. And I won't belabor every single step of the way, but it was frustrating. Yeah. He went into treatment, but he was dismissed from the treatment prematurely. He came home. We were both disappointed, but he said to me, I'm going to look on the bright side because I can return to work. He said, and I was worried about losing my job. He said, so if we can get me Suboxone, which is buprenorphine, he said, I know I can fight this on my own. Well, I tried to get it for him and failed and he died within days. So What I didn't know, and there's a list of things I didn't know, is that when you're released from short-term treatment, your chances of dying quadruple and then some because your resistance is down, your tolerance is down, and you think you can use the same amount. And he had, because he didn't have the relief that the Suboxone would have given him. And in making the phone calls, I printed out a list of all the doctors in this area that offer it. And I was calling and calling, calling. In some places I left messages, in some places I couldn't get through. But- One man yelled at me and he said, don't you know you're just prolonging the problem? Don't you know he could be on that for the rest of his life? You're just substituting one drug for another. And he intimidated me and I thought, okay, no, you know, I'll call the next person. But boy, looking back on it and knowing what I know now and that the science is not confused about the benefit of that medication. No, it doesn't prolong the problem. It prolongs life. And so what if he's on it for the rest of his life? People are on Prozac or lots of other different things. This is a medication that helps that person with that condition. You're not high. You can take care of your family. You can go to work. And would I rather have him and be on Suboxone for the rest of his life or not have him? So it's inexcusable that there are restrictions on these medications. You can't get it. And there's not that many doctors that prescribe it, right? Well, no wonder, because you have to take a certain course in order to prescribe it. Now, you can be a nurse practitioner fresh out of a school and you can write a prescription for OxyContin, but a physician in practice for however many years can't write a prescription for a much safer drug, buprenorphine, because it addresses addiction and addiction is shameful. And so they have made, also they let perfect be the enemy of good because they worry about diversion. So you give somebody a prescription for buprenorphine, they could peddle it on the streets. Well, most of the people looking for it on the streets are looking for it because they want to recover and you can't get it. So if it were readily available, it should be available as a form of harm reduction and it should be available as a form of treatment. And the fact that people are on it sometimes for life doesn't matter. It's nobody else's concern. It is. You are not high. So So your book is called Cover My Dreams in Ink. How'd you get the title and what do you talk about in your book? What do you write about? Well, what inspired me is after... Paul died, I had his laptop. And of course, given our relationship, I had his password to everything. 
He'd sometimes tell me to fix something on Facebook for him. So I looked at his poetry and Paul was a person who had a language impairment. And so he didn't say much. He had deeper thoughts than most people knew, because by the time he retrieved a word and then put it in a sentence, you would have moved on to the next topic. And so he just learned early in life that he didn't offer anything up. So people thought he was slow and didn't have much to say. And he went through special education and we never found a good fit. A lot of good people, but not a good fit. And so I was reading his poetry and it didn't shock me because he had sent me some of his poems and I knew he was talented. But I just thought about how incredibly talented he was and how much he didn't do it for sharing it with anybody. It was his means of self-expression. And here he was, this person who seemed so tentative and so unlikely to join the conversation with writing this beautiful poetry. So I thought, I'm going to publish the poetry. Then I thought, but the poetry without a background of his life is less interesting. So then I decided to write the story about his life and I intertwined his poetry. And the cover my dreams in ink is a line from one of his poems. And the poem is called Pleading with Gravity. And it's poignant, but he was essentially talking about how, you know, life had been hard on him and he just wanted to cover his dreams in ink because ink being his poetry. Do you have and, the book handy? Do you want to read one? Do you want to read that? Yeah, I'll read I'll read that poem. Happen to have the book handy. <laughs> um Let's see. There it is. I can't promise I won't cry. It's the title again is Pleading with Gravity. Oh, gravity, why do you blind me with your wicked, ill-fated tempers? Every time I attempt to climb up and out of your crippling power, you welcome me with a fall from grace back to your cold ground. Am I destined to your chains? Am I a part of your city sidewalk in a puddle of beer or cracked glass? Do you contain my prayers so they'll never reach the maker? Do you intercept these wishes and hide them? I want to sing and climb on stars, gravity. I want to do a handstand on the moon and dip my feet in the Pacific. I want to cover miles to grasp a notion of what infinity means. I want to cover my dreams in ink and repel you with my pen. I want to hide in my poem and sleep with my own inspiration. But I'm stuck here with you, gravity, and I'm bearing your weight for you. Wow. And so... The no one would ever my, know that he had those words in him, right? If you no about- one did. And his vocabulary, and he never had a real education because his special education classes landed him in non-academic settings, like he was doing gardening and food service and learning how to set a table and dress for success kinds of things. And so the vocabulary, his sister and I were just blown away at so much of it. You had and some of it's of it. lighthearted, but some of it like that. And the cover of my dreams in ink in this context, it just jumped out at me because here I am writing a book and my dreams are shattered too. And so I'm covering my dreams in ink. Wow. And so I, was, I proceeded to write the book and it was therapeutic for me. It was, I probably learned as much about myself and about addiction and Paul and family relationships that you just do in writing a memoir. You just do. So it isn't just that our topic was one that was so laden with misunderstandings and our own missteps, which I acknowledged certainly on my part. And I think that's another important thing for parents to know is that we all make mistakes. There is no perfect parent. And you just have to learn from your mistakes. That's how we get smarter. It's just a fact. What did you learn about yourself in writing the book? Anything that you want to share about that? Oh, so much. I learned a lot that I didn't know, even though I tried to stay up on things and I never did turn my back on him. But I learned about things that have to do with addiction and treatment. He was incarcerated at one point. It was the worst place for him. And so I learned a lot about how much he suffered and ways that he tried to get help and how consistently we struck out. And the theme of systems, the special education system, the healthcare system, and I'm not saying there weren't good people embedded in these systems, but the system, the criminal justice system, the treatment system, it just, it failed us every step of the way. But I also learned about myself that I can be too accommodating, that I maybe smooth over problems to try to keep everybody on an even keel, and that sometimes that shortchanged Paul. So that hit me like a ton of bricks. Because I didn't know that. I knew that I'd made mistakes and I have always been pretty forthcoming about that. But 
I didn't realize the extent of some of just character traits that I think I probably still have. But it was very interesting. When you pull together experiences over 30 years, something that you thought was disparate from something else, because there's 18 years between them, you realize there's a thread. There's a thread. And I think I modeled for my children that their needs weren't as important as other people's because that's how I conducted myself in just trying to be the peacekeeper. So it isn't just that you say to yourself, well, I didn't stand up for myself, but then you're modeling behavior all the time. And yeah. your, your kids learn more from what you do than what you say, right? So I, my analogy has always been the person who yells at their child at the dinner table for having poor manners. I think, wait a minute, and yeah. you shouldn't be yelling, you know, so you exemplify the things that you don't want them to do. How has so, your relationship with your daughter changed since this all happened? Well, my relationship with her was always close. We certainly have acknowledged that her being the sibling of a child with special needs put her on the back burner sometimes. And there are common characteristics that people in her position have. And she knew that. And they can also be overly accommodating, perfect. I'm not going to rebel or do anything because mom's already overly stressed with this other situation. So we've talked about that. We've talked about how close she and Paul were and how hard it was for her, though, going away to college and he was hospitalized for a mental illness. This was long before the drug use and just how she got poor grades that semester that he was hospitalized. So it was always hard for her. But in terms of our relationship, we've always been very close. And she was devastated by his death, devastated. I mean, she was just sort of crumbling. (laughs) And so her only sibling, they were close growing up. And she said to me just the other day, she said, I'm an only child. So it's certainly just as close as it's ever been. But I think we share, just the two of us, a profound connection through having weathered just living in the same house with him and and all that we went through, even though we were in very different roles. She's three years older, so she certainly is a full-blown adult. And she's a teacher herself. And she said to me, she said, he's my hero. And he always will be. So Uh I have a friend who's son died and the existing children resent him and resent the drug use. And, and I said to her, they'll outgrow that. They just do right now. And there's, you can't force people to see things a different way. It takes time. Do you have a favorite poem or piece of his writing? Here's a piece of his writing that I think is pretty remarkable. This was something he wrote after he'd had an, a disagreement with a girlfriend when he was maybe 28. And so it's not a poem. It's just something I got from his journal. And he titled it Mood Disorder. If only I could write to you a few stanzas of gibberish or spill a few abstract thoughts on paper that could be interpreted as something other than mood, you and I could reanalyze this mess. Maybe within some spontaneous action, you and I could rechannel conflict into love and we too could find our staple in history, as did the Romeo and Juliets of time. But you and I are only able to move under pressure. So just entertaining the thought may be damaging to my health. As internal flames flare and take their shape in an array of smoldering words never meant to leave our lips, my conscience takes another small breath and suffocates, and I am at once blinded by anger. It's not the hurtful thing said that takes such a bad effect. It's the unwillingness to compromise. And free from the reins of reason, I am a ticking time bomb unable to budge in any margin of reasonability. And within a few short moments, I again will be out the door, beyond the lawn, and down the hill to collect what rational thought is left. The moment is seized as reality rears its head to soothe my frustration in its breathtaking draw. And once again, I am alone. There is no reason that the authors I had once admired or the musicians I've idealized could inspire me enough to catapult me from this muck. I am in fact crawling for whatever scraps are left of this dying. And inspiration is a dimly lit porch light far off in the night. Wow. What struck me about that is that he wrote this within days of his argument with the girlfriend. So his self-awareness at the age of 20-something is beyond what mine mine was. And just the fact that he would sit down and write, it was his means, though. when When you have thoughts that are more sophisticated then you're able to share. He started to write under the covers at night with a flashlight when he was a teenager. But because one of his disabilities was also a hand tremor, you couldn't read what he wrote. 
he'd write and write and write, and then he'd take he'd tear the pages out of a spiral notebook and ball them up and take them and throw them in the trash. And I'd smooth them out and try to read them. <laughs> and the ones I could decipher just a little bit, a few lines, I said, this is good. And I told him, I said, you know, you should share this with your teacher. I can type them. And he said, no, there's no point. This was high school. He had already decided school was useless and no one there recognized any strength that he had. He said, I want to read. I want to study science. I want, but he never got the opportunity to do that. So, and his job when he died, he was a bicycle delivery driver for a sandwich shop in downtown Annapolis. And he loved it. He loved it. That's and it was awesome. perfect for him. So, yeah. Well, as we wrap this up, what advice do you have for people listening to this episode about what they can do to further legislation that will help the United States move forward in this situation with the opioid, opioid epidemic. And well, there, there are harm reduction initiatives that we are slow to adopt, and they've been proven to save lives. And it starts with the needle exchange and all the way through the overdose pre- prevention sites. Philadelphia is in the midst of opening one, and that's a good thing. And they're, they're, it's likely, you know, like gay marriage. Everybody thought that'll never happen. And then it moved fast once it did. And so I'm in favor, too, of decriminalizing, not legalizing, decriminalizing. And Oregon just did in this November election. And so that will go a long way. So the more we can keep people out of jail, keep them out of the criminal justice system, and in, and in essence, really and truly, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but take the police out of health care. Yeah, I mean, that's health care and they are so involved and the DEA and the amount of money we get these budgets to devote to the overdose crisis. And we're spending the money on blocking packages coming in from Mexico and scanning packages coming in from China. And it's all focused on the supply side. And it's proven the data is clear. The supply side isn't going to work. It's the demand side we have to work on. And so we just waste money. And so anything people can do to open their minds to to shed the stigma, to see it as a medical condition, to support these initiatives that have worked in other modern countries. If you look at the death toll in the United States, we're the top line. So that's per hundred thousand people. So it's not it's apples and apples. And we have more people incarcerated than any country in the world by far. You know, we have five percent of the world's population and 25 percent of its prisoners. So knowing that we have the highest overdose death the highest incarceration rate and less harm reduction than other modern countries. We just need to move into taking care of these people and not shaming them. Why don't you send me some links to some websites that you'd like to go to that provide some of this data and I'll put that in the show notes. I'll do it. All right. Okay. Jesse, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your son today in the book, you know, by reading his writings. I love that. And, um, for everything that you're doing to help other parents never have to be in the Well, and I'm happy to help people one-on-one or do whatever I can. If I can help one other person, then Paul's life served a wonderful purpose. And so that's what I'm all about. And while I don't literally have seance-like experiences, I hear him saying to me, you go, mom. It's what he would want. He was very kind-hearted. Paul is cheering you on. I'm sure of it. Oh, me too. Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now. Now is the time to get involved. We have a new administration focused on public health issues and be on the lookout for discussions on harm reduction and other policies aimed at curbing the opioid crisis, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the reviews of Jesse's book states, this book's importance is that it transcends one mother's story. It's certainly a cautionary tale. Cover My Dreams in Ink tells the story of a boy misunderstood from learning disabilities to a mental health diagnosis to drug addiction. He's at the mercy of systems, school, healthcare, legal, that increasingly fail him. Constrained by a language impairment, the boy keeps to himself. His outlet is writing, but his writing is illegible, mirroring the pattern of discounting marginalization of the lesser among us. From the discovery of a drug that provided relief to the pure hell of addiction, exploited, humiliated, punished, and from homelessness and jail cells to rehab and a wanderlust fueled by the relentless quest to belong, his young manhood is full of heartache. 
yet his grit and resilience, at times formidable counterforce to the wounds of injustice, provide hope. The pages recount the journey of an individual, but the message is universal human rights, a principle too easily sidestepped, even negated for the vulnerable. By inspiring sensitivity for those who are different, compassion for those whose battles arise from uncontrollable circumstances rather than faults of character, this story shines a light on the human toll of the war on drugs and drives home the urgency for drug policy reform. I put a link to Jesse's book in the show notes, as well as links to some other books that she recommends and links to some of the studies that she talked about in the interview. Thank you for listening. And please share this episode with somebody else who needs to hear it. And that means all of your friends. We really need everybody to help address this issue. Thank you. Thank you.